This is The Healthy Healer, where true voice is your medicine. This is where we help doctors and other healers navigate through the challenging times by learning from the best minds in the healing industry. Laugh, cry, and be surprised. It's entertainment, education, and inspiration so you can continue to be the unique and amazing healer you were destined to be. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to The Healthy Healer with Dr. Fred. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Fred, and welcome to the next amazing episode of The Healthy Healer. Today, we're going overseas. We're crossing the pond to the UK to interview an incredible person who's up to incredible things. Kai Graham is here with us today and has really brought forth a new way of looking at relationships between parents and their teenagers. Many of us know what that relationship actually entails in our world, but what we didn't know is that there's healing and capable, healing available in that relationship that perhaps we never thought of. Some of us just tolerate our teenagers and some of us as teenagers just tolerate our parents. What we have here is an opportunity to bridge that gap, and that's where Kai has really stepped in with her expertise. I can't wait to share with you a little bit more about how Kai became who she became and who she is. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Kai Graham. Kai, thanks for being here with us. Just flung my mobile across the room. That's, that's what you have to do. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's a cool way to start. We're talking about little problems that need to be solved, but you talk about a big problem that needs to be bridged. Tell us a little bit, Kai. First of all, I ask I like to ask my guests a simple nine-letter question that really gets us started. And that question is, Kai Graham, who are you? I am predominantly I am a wife and a mum. That is the role that I take very seriously. My kids are now 28 and 30. And I'm thrilled to say that we're still speaking and we're still sort of seeking each other's company. So, we're, we're, you know, we're not sort of doing too badly, but it hasn't always been that way. And we've had the sort of, you know, the, the sort of rocky road of sort of adolescence, but thankfully that's sort of behind us. I am really career wise, my I am a, a family anxiety specialist. So I support families and specifically teens and young adults up to about sort of 20 something who are struggling with the mental health and anxiety is the big one anxiety is the one that I sort of focus on the most because it sort of seems to rear its ugly head in all shapes and forms be it self-harm depression eating disorders it, the list is endless and following covid families are still struggling and it's it's the, the the figures are getting worse rather than better so it's my job to sort of help families as a whole Fantastic. And I see that, you know, and I hear you loud and clear that part of this came from your own experience as a mom and as a wife, as a family woman, yeah. as someone completely committed to the, that position in life. And your rocky road that you had with your two children certainly led to at least some degree of um, maybe being enlightened to what your role could be to help other folks. Is that a bit fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, and it was not only not only my own kids, but other people's. I, I sort of I've been doing the sort of the coaching aspect of my work for probably about 10, 11 years. And I was working as a life coach for women, you know, sort of helping them sort of develop their, their, their own path. But what was very, very clear to me, I was actually working with the UK's leading child counselling service. It was a charity called Childline. And the mums were coming to me and go, listen, listen, I know I need help, but please will you help my child? Please will you help my child? And, you know, so 10 years ago, there wasn't so much support there. So spotted the, the gap in the market. And uh, so I've been helping sort of through my own private practice, but through my work with Childline as well. I've since left, left them, but I was working with them and was very mindful of the struggles that teenagers are, are Sort of are encompassing because the, the, it's a very different world from when we grew up, and you know, so parents are finding it hard to support their kids based on their own experiences because it's, as I said, it's a different world, and our kids are facing sort of similar but very different um, challenges. So that's that's where I sort of came to do what I'm doing. Right, and now you call it a gap in the market. Is that what you said exactly? Oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's better nowadays. I, I can't help but uh, not cross over being mindful of the gap, of course, and, you know, given what little I know about my 
London. And so <laughs> I want to I want to talk to a little bit about what is that gap and how, you know, what is what have you really noticed and where can you be effective in assisting teenagers who may not think that they need assistance? Maybe they think they're just right. I think the thing is, is that a lot of parents are coming to me and sort of saying, oh, well, you know, they're really playing up or they're sort of, you know, oh, I can't cope with the attitude. And they're sort of saying, but sure, it's only a phase. And yes, it could be a phase. I mean, you know, sort of adolescence is hard. And yet I think many parents have forgotten that. And what we need to do is to remember that our kids actually need support. I mean, I, whenever I speak to sort of my mum, they were parenting us in a very, very different way. And so mum sort of used to sort of say to me, well, gosh, you, you sort of seem to be very au fait with what the kids are going through at the minute. I never knew what you were up to, as if to say that was OK. And in my view, it's not because our kids do need to, I mean, you know, when they're little, they need to be managed, they need to be fed and watered and looked after and guided. But when they get sort of adolescence and when the hormones kick in, we can't manage our teenagers any longer because they're, they're trying to be independent. They don't want it. And so what we have to do is as parents, we have to move from the managerial role to the mentoring role to be able to guide them and to still, I mean, my kids are as I said, 28 and 30, and they still need sort of support. They still sort of ask me to be a sounding board. And we need as parents to remember that without suffocating them, which is the fine line that we're sort of yeah. we're trying, um, just to be there and to listen rather than give advice all the time, to be there to listen and just sort of see what's going on for our kids, because sometimes we're not very good at that. Yeah, that listening thing is really not so simple for some of us human beings. You know, right. Many of us actually listen simply waiting for the next time that we have something to say. Exactly. Like You're just right. almost tolerating the other person's noise in between the things that we want to say. And and that, I, go ahead. I, I think that's, and it, that's a hard one for parents because we've been around the block a few times and we sort of know what's going on and we've, you know, we think we know the answers to everything. And invariably, we might do to some to, to some extent, but our kids aren't going to learn if we keep on spoon feeding them the answers. And what we need to do is stand back and allow them to tumble and allow them to sort of mess up and allow them to learn their own lessons. So they grow into sort of, you know, sort of fully formed and fully fledged adults. Because if we spoon feed all this, you know, all the answers, all the solutions, then our kids aren't going to learn anything. Exactly. That's so true. And, you know, it is a hard lesson to learn to watch your kids stumble and watch them get hurt, watch them fall flat on their face, watch them make mistakes, even if yeah. it's mistakes that you might have been able to prevent had you intervened earlier. Absolutely. But that is the, the finest form of learning, in fact, is failure. And failure comes with the effort to actually create outcomes. And so being mindful of that and allowing for that inside of our listening is a trick. Do you help parents with that directly? Yeah, I do. And I've, I've got, a, I've, I've got a, an exercise that I, um, I sort of help parents with. And, and um, if it's OK, I'll sort of share it with you. you yeah, guys. Yeah. It's called the three questions, because invariably what happens is parents want to know exactly what's going on in their kids' lives. And the, the teenagers don't want that they are resistant to it so this is one of the reasons why they run up to their rooms or they hide away or they sort of roll their eyes and sort of a very monosyllabic and so we're, we're coming from sort of you know two ends of the spectrum here and what we need to do is meet in the middle so i've got an exercise that the parents can share with their kids because it, it, it you know they need to know what's going on here but it's called three questions the first question is what is your number and it's kids are able to answer from a scale of one to ten one being really really bad and really struggling and ten being absolutely fine and dandy skip it through the tulips you can leave me well alone and so yeah. from that the parents will go right okay well i've got a benchmark on how my my kids are doing here and to be fair only use this once a day if it's once an hour it'll you know it'll lose its sort of you know its spark but that helps kids or the, the young people to be able to sort of get it across to mum. This is a, what this is how I'm feeling on a scale of one to ten. The second question is, what's your word? 
So it's giving you a describing word of how you're feeling right now, today. And it could be, you know, yeah, and okay, doesn't cut it. We've got to have a proper word that describes it. And actually, this is great because it helps it, it, it helps to develop our kids' emotional intelligence and their emotional literature because, you know, it could be going, oh, well, I'm mad. Okay, well, you were mad yesterday. Is it the same mad? Oh, no, no, I was mad yesterday because my teacher gave me an F in math. And today I'm mad because, you know, my, my best mate let me down. All oh, right, well, what's this? Is it is it sort of betrayal? Is it embarrassment? All this, and it sort of helps our kids to be able to, um, you know, sort of reveal how they're so to get in contact with their own sort of thoughts and feelings and then the third question is do you want to talk and nine times out of ten you'll go oh no 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 not interested no thanks no i'm fine no no because kids don't really want to but what this does is it keeps the door open for parents to be able to communicate and to say to their kids i've got your back i'm here for you when you're ready and the thing is, is that at one time when the child sort of comes up and says, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, don't jump on it. Don't go, oh, well, I know there was something wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. Just say, well, is now the time to talk? Or do you want to go for a walk? Or do you want to make cookies and we can just go that way? Or do you want to go for a drive? And the thing is, it's just basically allowing the teenager, the young person, to dictate how the conversation goes and at their pace. But the great thing is, is that the kids seem to sort of come out of their room a bit, seem to be hanging out in downstairs a bit more because they know that they're not going to get the Spanish Inquisition from mum or dad. So, you know, many parents have said to me, oh my gosh, this is absolute gold. One month, mum sort of turned I said, I'm actually I'm having quite nice conversations now. I quite like who, who my sort of teenage is becoming. And so it allows both parties to be able to communicate with the parents get enough information because they're sort of, you know, they're, they're getting a, a yardstick of how the kids are doing. And the kids actually don't have feel as though, as I said, that they're getting the Spanish Inquisition the whole time. Yeah, beautiful. And it really gives them some control over how the conversation goes and when they're ready to speak is the time that they get to speak. Precisely. They, yeah, they give they are able to give some benchmarks of, you know, what is their number, what is their word. That's and it. even they become maybe get a little practice on being descriptive about how they're experiencing life inside of what is their word, and then be able to dictate or be able to at least create an opportunity to say yes or no and when they want to share whatever the details. Yeah. yeah, that's really beautiful. And I'm wondering, is this something that is, it seems like it might be even have a broader application beyond parent and child. Like, you know, I'm wondering if it ever flips on itself. Does a child ever ask a parent that? Or do, am I available to ask these questions to my friends or to my other, you know, to my wife or something like that? Just you know three important questions no matter what the relationship is uh, that was it and also it was a way of one of my clients sort of came back to me and he went hey hey you know that three questions thing and i went yeah and he went i was able to use it with a mate of mine and he was really he was you know he was in a bad space he wasn't able to communicate he was really struggling and he said by using these three questions I was able to gauge and get the minimal amount of information, but to show him that I was there to listen. And he said eventually he opened up and eventually he was able to sort of, you know, communicate how he was getting on. So, yeah, you're quite right. But it, it, could, it could be done with a tricky boss or whatever. So, yeah, it, it, it doesn't just sort of stick to the parent and, and child sort of dynamic. You're quite right, Dr. Fred. Yeah, that's right. And so... You know, what is the what are the kind of services that grow from these three questions? When someone asks those three questions or someone learns about those three questions, how can they expect uh, the assistance from you? What kind of structure do you provide or what kind of additional questions or inquiries that allow for the healing of the teenager adult relationship inside of a family? Well, th this was, as I said, this this is an exercise that I just furnish. But you know, when parents parents can come to me and they are sort of struggling with the dynamic at home, and maybe there's too much conflict, or there's you know sort of a, that they don't know how to support their child in the right way. I mean, sort of 
a lot of parents with kids with either eating disorders or self-harm, for example, really struggling because they don't know how to relate to what's going on if it hasn't been in their life up until now. So I would sort of I would offer a lot of support for parents on what to say and what not to say to kids and to validate sort of you know sort of their teenagers' feelings. They might not agree with them. So it's it's a matter of uh, you know sort of communicating with the parent to actually so maybe walk a mile in their child's shoes rather than the sort of whoa judgmental and sort of slight your I know best type thing because that's not going to cut it with a teenager but also a lot of the work I do is with the teens themselves so you know and it's quite interesting sort of because the parent sort of you know signs me up and says I need you to speak to let's call her Sarah Sarah's really struggling. She's her grades have gone down. Her time management's awful. Her her organisational skills aren't going well, and she's just not cutting it at school. The grades are just not good. So right, okay, great, thank you. So I then chat to Sarah, and you know what? It's got very very little to do with that. It's all about Sarah's mindset. It's all about what's going on on the exter- in her external world that is therefore you know affecting her her and, and how she, her behaviours and her actions. You know, I was, I was helping her for, for a while and we we were sort of talking about mean girls and sort of sexting and, and friendships and relationships and what to do when you get caught at school with a bottle of vodka and that sort of stuff. And none of none of which I discussed with Sarah was about time management and organisation and her grades. But what happened was helping Sarah with her mindset and and the, her life and how to deal with life as a whole she got an unconditional offer from college to go to, or to, to fashion school and so it was a win-win mum was absolutely thrilled to bits because obviously the grades went up sarah was in a lot better space because it was her head that was in a better space and so therefore she was better able to have, apply herself so what i've learned is when you hear what parents think they need and what the kids actually need it's two very different things but funnily enough the end result's usually the same so that's how I yeah 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 just a just a, a cleaner capacity to function you know to function productively yeah 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 and what do you tell a child who wants to know wants some help in what to do when they get caught uh, dipping into the bottle of vodka what do you what is it Dr. Fred, actions have consequences, don't they? <laughs> and I think the thing is, is that this this particular example, this young girl, she just moved schools, and she was she was carrying the can for other people, to, you know, sadly, and uh, she was the one that got caught. But she was she learned about loyalty, she learned about priorities, she learned, you know, and it was basically she had to take it on the chin, and she sort of served her time, and then was able to again sort of speak to to, to the sort of you know the various member of staff and she had a big mountain to climb she had to prove herself but she did she did it but it was she started off with oh it's so unfair I said well listen let's unpack that and see really what's going on here and um yeah you know if the thing is is and I think kids have to sort of appreciate that if they want to be treated like adults, then they need to act like adults. And sometimes it's sort of, you know, accepting that we mess up and, um, you know, you have to sort of take responsibility of your own actions. You know, you bring up with something here that I, I don't usually dip into my own history, but as I, I just got reminded of something, which was... And as a teenager, I believe it was 11th, 11th grade, so a uh, junior in college, in high school, I was in a speech class and I had to give an open speech and I chose to give a speech on bartending. And I, I clearly had never been a bartender before, and but I had all the equipment in my bag, including lemon juice that I was going to use as, as part of my props. Yeah. And then afterwards, I never emptied my locker so I always kept crap in my, my locker was just adding up with boy level nonsense, right? And I had a bag of stuff that was a bartending equipment. And then I had a little bottle of fermenting lemon juice. Oh, good one. So by the time that the, the authorities got into my locker, they found this bag and then they found this lemon juice and were pretty sure, of course, that it was alcohol, which it probably was by that <laughs> And I got suspended for bringing alcohol to school when in fact I 
ever brought alcohol to school, and I couldn't support myself. And I need to tell you, Kai, that was unfair. However, yes, who cares? Yes. In the end, that's the consequences of a world that is frequently packed with being unfair. Yeah. What was I, the lesson you learned? I think the lesson I learned was the world can be unfair, and either way, there's consequences. And I probably should clean out my locker. Every day. Just like clean up, clean up your own shit. <laughs> Exactly. You're quite right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I had I had mixing bowl. I had the, I had everything. Shot glasses. I had all the stuff because I was teaching. I was my speakers about bartending. And anyway, um, all right. So let's let's talk a little bit about you know what what is the future? What is the future of maybe teenagers? You mentioned that there's been you know a massive paradigmatic shift not only from when we grew up. Assuming yeah. that you and I are from at least a similar generation, yeah. Uh, but beyond, I, I also have a thirty-year-old and a thirty-two-year-old. That's how I know that. Yeah. So the idea being like, what are we looking at with this last group of kids who have often been homeschooled in middle school or early high school, whatever that means to be homeschooled? Certainly not, no longer uniform, yeah. and um, so different from household to household. And a different set of understanding of what the work ethic is or how and when to do work or how and when to do play or what's allowed and what's not allowed. What is uh, attractive and what's, you know, re, um, you know, repulsive. What are the things that kids are doing now? What do you what do you see moving into the future as our middle, you know, as our young adolescents or even pre-adolescents grow to adolescents, what are you noticing in the trend here? First of all, I think, without getting too political, I am hugely embarrassed by our, our inheriting, not only looking at the economy, but looking at the planet as a whole. And I remember, you know, my son, as he was going into middle school, he must have been about, yeah, he literally, his first first week in middle, middle school, he was sitting there with a face, you know, like a wet weekend. And I just sort of said, what's going on here? And he went, this is it, isn't it? When I went, what? And he went, I've got exams, exams, exams. And then if I do well enough, I get into college. And if I do well enough, I get onto the rat race. And I go to a job that I'm probably not going to enjoy, trying to buy a house that I'll never be able to afford. And I just thought, whoa. And he was just such a young young child going in with that, that attitude. And actually, I couldn't blame him, blame him because, you know, the, the, uh, when, when I was growing up, it was a sort of, you know, the, the, the 80s it was very much, oh, you can have it all and you can work really, really hard and you'll get it all on a plate and, you know... And, and yet that's not what our kids are sort of um, open to. We've, they've got so much student debt. They've got so much, you know, the, the house prices are through the roof. The economy is on its knees and forget about the planet. And, and our kids are just going, why? And, you know, what, what's it all about? And I'm seeing our, our, our sort of kids' generation, uh, they're a lot more conscious about... Um, about themselves and about the planet and about other people. And I mean, my kids now, I, my, my daughter's looking for a, a, another job. Um, she's just sort of, um, she, she's just sort of moving careers. And she sort of said, oh, well, I, I'm just applying to X, Y, and Z. And I said, oh, well, she said, yeah, I've been doing my due diligence. And she said, I, 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 I like what they stand for. And I said, well, these guys, someone else has got an opening. And she came back and she went, there's no way I'm gonna work for them. And I went, why? So well, good. look at their values. They certainly don't sort of, you know, line up with me. And for our kids now, it's it's it, they have different different values. Well, you know, we, we we all do, but they have different sort of a different perspective on. In my day, it was work, 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 work. You know, sort of, you know, live to work. And now I think our kids are, are very much know we're going to work to live. And there is less career ambition and more lifestyle ambition. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. And I salute them for it. You know, they're less chasing the sort of pay packet and more wanting to experience life and and what can they give back. You know, that, that there's a hugely a big compassion thread sort of going through this generation, and I think it's wonderful. A lot of the kids I see, the ones with anxiety, 
sort of do the I don't know what's going on here and I can't put my finger on it but it's got to stop because it just feels so bad and invariably it's because they look at the future and they can't quite put their finger on where they're heading and it's it's frightening for them and it's you know it's it's a bit sort of destabilizing because in our day it was you get a job for life and you work really hard and you're either in the medical profession the finance profession the legal profession you just get on with it and nowadays it's there's a myriad of stuff that they can do and and with choice comes uncertainty and with uncertainty comes anxiety and that's what a lot of kids are struggling with at the minute is working out exactly where they're heading yeah it's very brilliant to speak to choice uncertainty and anxiety as a t point said it makes a lot of sense and you know the in the sort of uh the challenge of what it is to be sort of in uh, before the pre-workforce, like in the pre-workforce stages, looking at the future as it unfolds and wh how, where do I fit in and what direction is there to go in and That's it. is it lifestyle or is it work style or, you know, yeah. do I get to choose, it? Where, where do I get to choose and where do I not get to choose? There's like a, an openness there that is brilliant and entirely unsettling at the same time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to ask you, Kai, if people want to work from with you, do they have to live in the UK or is this something you do worldwide or what are we talking about here? D dare I say it, Dr. Fred, I since COVID that I the business has, has, dare I say it, has been good because because of COVID. But it has also allowed people to realize that Zoom and StreamYard are pretty handy because I used when I before COVID, I was very much sort of, you know, one to one. And then COVID came and I've got clients in Canada, America, France. Spain, you know, across Europe, and I'm based in the UK. So, no, quite easily, people can sort of get in contact with me through my website. My name's on the screen, Kai Graham, so it's kaigraham.com, and people can reach me there. Okay, well, we'll certainly have that in the uh, show notes, as well as other information that you provided in the bio. Is there anything you want to say to our listeners before leaving? Maybe something like a jam or a nugget that you'd like to leave down on the ground here for us so that we know... You know, so we learned something even more so than what you've already taught us, which is plenty, by the way, in 28 minutes. So good job with that. Thank you. I would just want just to sort of share that anxiety is something, as I said uh, at the top of the call, that is something I specialize in. And the kids that come to me, when they experience, you know, when they're experiencing anxiety, to them, they feel as though they're broken, as though their life is just a real struggle, which it is. But I try and explain that anxiety is a learned behavior. And by that, we can then unlearn it. And so I've a, literally a new book out on Amazon, Fearless and Free, which is an anxiety workbook, which you can also find through my website. And it's, it, it gives a lot of practical tips and sort of guidance. But all I want to sort of say is for, for people to understand that anxiety is just biology. And it is the, the sort of the reptilian part of the brain, which is this guy, the amygdala, who is looking for saber-toothed tigers the whole time. And once this brain realized, you know what? Half these things I'm worried about are not saber-toothed tigers. We don't have to get our knickers in a twist all the time. Then that helps people realize, oh, this is biology. I'm good. I understand it now. It's just my body and my mind going into overdrive. And so the, the book I, I mentioned has got loads of techniques to say, hang on a minute, let's just put a break on here and let's just work out how we can move forward and brighter future because anxiety doesn't have to stop us in our tracks. Right. You can live, you can, yeah, when you have anxiety, you can either uh, be stopped by it or go forward with it. You know, absolutely. It's like that. We do. We don't want to cure, we don't want to get rid of anxiety because it is our friend. It yeah, stops sure. us putting our hand in the flame or, or, or sort of, you know, getting sort of going under a number 74 bus. It, it shows that we need to pay attention. Exactly. So we don't want to ignore it altogether. Fantastic. Kai, thank you so much for being a wonderful guest for the, for the Healthy Healer. It's been a pleasure having you on and we really have enjoyed being with you. Thank you for your- Thank you so much, Dr. Fred. It's been great, great speaking to you. Thank you. All right, take care. We'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, listeners, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.